Welcome everybody to Big Think Live. I'm Victoria Montgomery Brown, co-founder and CEO of Big Think. Today's topic is the year that broke our illusions with the incredible magician, author, Penn Gillette, who also stars in Penn & Teller, Fool Us on the CW, as well as his own podcast. So it's such an incredible pleasure to have you here again, Penn. And so everybody knows this is live and there'll be an audience uh, question portion towards the end of it. So whatever platform you're on, please start typing in your questions for Penn immediately. Immediately, so, right now, get to right. it. So just, I mean, Penn, you're such a, you know, incredible speaker and thinker, way more than a magician. This year so far has been crazy. Let's just jump right in. What illusions for you have been shattered so far this year, if any? Well, you know, uh, the, the ones that have been shattered, I'm afraid, are, are all uh, kind of cliche. So many people uh, agree with it. I mean, I believed firmly and strongly uh, that there was never a president of the United States that wasn't much smarter than me. Um, there were presidents that I disagreed with very much philosophically and uh, who I uh, who I just thought were, were making very bad decisions, but they all seemed like they were wicked smarter, smarter than me. And for the first time, we had a president that I knew, you know, I know personally and have worked with and uh, who does not seem smarter than me. And that's a fairly low bar for a president, you know, and, um, and that was terrifying. And I had this feeling and I suppose, you know, illusion, uh, often has the connotation of something positive, but I had this kind of, um, uh, negative illusion, I suppose, uh, one that I think is believed by the QAnon people that, um, when you became president, no matter who you were or how you became president, like if I became president, that the day I'd walk into the room, they'd say, you know, okay, kid, you made it to president, but here's what we really do. Mm -hmm. I thought there actually was a, a cabal of adults, grownups, and maybe they were sinister. Maybe they did not have the people's best interest in mind, but they somehow were there to beat you up and make you do what they told you to do. And I just kind of believed that if by some weird, you know, movie style chance that me or one of my goofball stooge friends became a uh, president, that not that much would change. You know, I thought there were bosses. I remember when Ralph Nader said uh, when he was running for president that corporations really ran the country. Uh, when he said that, which, which was his idea of a nightmare, I took as kind of a good thing. Oh, good. We're in the hands of grownups. So if some goofball gets to be president, well, so what? And turns out presidents have power. And yeah. I think I was still kind of right until COVID hit because um, it still seemed like the American people could do stuff on their own. And I was kind of um, shocked uh, at how much uh, we, I, uh, need leadership. Right. I kind of thought that the American people, nah, why don't I say American in there? I kind of thought that people were uh, autonomous. Right. And I kind of thought the rugged individual was kind of a real thing. And then we have a president that doesn't wear a mask and holds rallies. And people don't wear masks and go to those rallies and then get sick. And maybe, maybe not many of them get sick and maybe not many of them die, but they will kill their parents and grandparents more likely. And um, I found that shocking. Uh, it just seems to me now that in this horrible time of COVID that actually having kind of a silly traditional leader would be a really good thing. It would make a difference. And you could not have convinced me of that a year ago. Well, so to that end, how complimentary do you think delusion is to illusion? Are those kind of hand in hand or not? 
Oh, I don't know. You know, uh, I, I try very hard, especially lately, to not be part of a team, to think of myself as either one or eight billion and not in between. I try not to think of myself as American or even um, atheist or even libertarian. I try to do this exercise, which I find um, really difficult, where I try to say those of us who voted for Trump instead of Trump voters, less us and them. Mm -hmm. But it seems, looking at the rest of the world, that a lot of the uh, illusions that I held dear, um, rugged individualism, um, uh, individual freedoms are coming back to, to bite us in the ass and very badly. I mean, it's awful to use that kind of, uh, jovial colloquial expression because the, the horror is so real. But I, I see the word libertarian being distorted so repulsively. Like it's a libertarian idea to be able to gather and it's a libertarian idea to be able to not wear a mask. Well, for those of us who have been hardcore libertarians and considered that and self-defined as that, I can see arguments for not wearing seatbelts and I can see arguments for not wearing motorcycle helmets, but I cannot see any argument for driving drunk. And that is what not wearing a mask is. It's not risking yourself. It's risking the people around you, which I don't see a way that that's your right. So the illusion that uh, there would be freedom and liberty as, a, as an embraceable, beautiful thing in the time of a pandemic uh, that is so far. I mean, I was actually asked, um, by some libertarian organizations, you know, you know, Pat, you live in Vegas and you should be leading the open up protests. You should be doing that as a libertarian. And I said, you know, I, I absolutely think that it is your personal right to have unprotected sex. Uh, with someone who is uh, HIV positive. I believe that's your right. But I don't want to advocate it, you know. And I do believe possibly in many situations that suicide is your right. But I, I, do, I don't want to advocate it. And that kind of irresponsibility seems crazy. The other illusion that has been troubling me uh, because uh, I usually like to have a bullshit solution. I mean, a solution that won't work, but they'll never let me do it. <laughs> That's what I'm always hoping for. You know, I'm always hoping that um, uh, there'll be a smart president like Obama and I will have um, ideas that are totally contrary to his and mine will never be tested. So in theory, mine will work because a grown up is doing the other thing and that's wrong. I liked having this adolescent approach. But in this position, I don't have even a bullshit, jive-ass, stupid solution. And that is, you know, if you were listening to me talk, and, you know, who was, in the early 90s, I was painting a picture of um, a world where um, – there would be no gatekeepers and everybody would just be saying whatever they wanted and that there would be a um, weird kind of meritocracy where if someone did a, of course I didn't have these words then, but a TikTok video or a YouTube video or a tweet that was compelling, that it would then spread around the world and how beautiful that is and how that leads to utopia. And I thought getting rid of the gatekeepers could be nothing but good. And now it seems like getting rid of the gatekeepers um, gave us Trump as president. And in the same breath, in the same wind, 
um, uh, gave us uh, uh, not wearing masks and maybe uh, gave us a, a, a huge unpleasant amount of, um, of overt racism. I mean, there are those who would argue, and I think correctly, that racism is part of our fabric. And even uh, those who, who, who don't feel any sort of racism are still have that systemically in them and, and endemically in them. But, and that doesn't surprise me, but the overt racism, the, um, the boogaloo and um, which may, there are some people in the boogaloo who claim not to be racist, but I'm not qualified to speak to that. But that kind of movement, um, I can't believe that came from my utopia, uh, utopian vision of what democracy would look like. And um, I had a solution then, right, which was let everybody have a voice. And now that solution has been ripped away from me because the solution does not seem to be censorship. And I can't even rant against cancel culture because uh, that's free speech, no matter how you put it. You know, if someone wants to go on Twitter and c claim that they were wronged in any way, and then other people want to jump on board and believe them, I don't know how we stop that from having someone and, and still be able to have someone who's legitimately wronged be able to voice that. Uh, and once again, the gatekeepers seemed like they were very, very important. If you were making a, a claim against someone and you went to your local police and they thought you were lying, it never got anywhere. And if you went to your newspaper and they thought you were lying, it never got anywhere. But now you could have, you could be obviously lying and still have a million and a half people believe you and do real damage to the person that you uh, you said wronged you. I have no solution for this, not even a cartoon kid adolescent solution. Well, so there's an illusion shot to hell. Did you expect every answer to be 10 minutes long? No, but I, I love it. So <laughs> anyway, I, I was listening to your podcast, Penn Sunday School, the other day, and there's a line I'm not going to get it exactly right, but you were talking um, with the other co-host about how if we look back at this period in 200 years, it's going to be far worse than we think it will be as the people in the future will look back at, at how we are today. What did you mean by that? Um, well, I meant by this uh, New Zealand and Australia. I mean, New Zealand and Australia did a terrible job with COVID compared to the ideal. Uh, I never thought we would be, and what is the factor? I mean, there's actually a number on this stuff. I mean, I believe we're 50,000 times worse. I mean, it, it, it's un, unspeakable numbers. I never thought that um, our citizens' irresponsible behavior could um, – could do this much damage. I mean, we're able to actually look at the numbers. And I suppose um, you can argue about blaming Trump, and that would be a reasonable argument. You could argue about blaming um, libertarian thought and individualism. You could argue about who you're blaming. But I think it's you can argue that somehow our culture, who we are, uh, killed 50, 75,000 people that probably didn't have to die. I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert, but my friends who are epidemiologists, and I have a couple of them, um, they're able to put a number on it. And I think when you, when you look back, uh, when we look back at 1917, we see, um, the very, very, uh, stupid, people who fought against masks then and had coughing parties uh, for who could cough the loudest and the most uh, as the, you know, the biggest disaster in human history happened, you know, the 1917 flu. And um, 
we've improved so much since in this hundred years. You know, we've we've decreased the violence, we've decreased the hunger, we've decreased so much of the suffering, we've turned up the empathy, we've turned up the compassion, and I would have thought we would have handled this uh, better, not perfectly, but I thought we would have done as well as Australia. I mean, they had the Bee Gees, we had Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, so I know our audience is going to want to know how you've been spending your time during the pandemic. On your podcast, I listened in it. I think you said you've been out maybe five times. So have any of your habits changed for positively or negatively during this time? Uh, well, um, yeah, uh, I, uh, I have been um, ridiculously safe. And that is a, uh, a luxury and a position of privilege. This is my safety is not a, uh, is not a result of intelligence and prudence. It's the result of me having, um, demonstratively the least necessary job you could possibly have. Uh, there's no reason to do live shows now for anybody. Um, and my desire to do live shows did not trump the um, desire to have people be safe. I mean, I really, really love being up in front of a crowd. This is the longest I've gone without doing live shows in 53 years. Wow. I started doing live shows when I was 12. And um, I don't think I've ever gone four months without. And I mean, by a live show, that might be for you know, five people in a nursing home juggling when I was a child. But, um, and I've gone out, you know, I've brought my uh, my daughter to see her close friends and she sits on the porch um, with a mask and they speak at a distance and I sit in the car and I've driven around, although much less than you'd think. If you'd asked me five months ago, what will you do? And I'd say, I would have said I'd take drives. I've taken, you know, five drives. I went out last night to watch my dear friend Piff the Magic Dragon, who was shooting a TV thing, and it was outdoors, and he was riding a horse, and my daughter uh, loves horses, and I thought we'd get in the car and go and watch that and stay very, very distant. Um, so I've been doing very, very little uh, outside of the house. Uh, Teller and I have done two um, TV specials uh, Don't uh, called Try This at Home. Uh, that we did on the CW. One is already aired. One's going to air. We did those from our home. Um, and uh, we, of course, wrote those. And it was a whole different way of writing. You know, we we wrote a card trick for uh, Elle Fanning to open a brand new deck of cards and do a card trick for her sister with us not being in the room. And I'll tell you, doing magic without touching the props, <laughs> god damn, that's a lot of thinking. Um, and I've been working with Teller over Zoom. Um, I, you know, I finished a novel. Um, as a friend of mine said, this lockdown is going to give us lots of divorces, lots of babies, and lots of bad novels. I'm certainly part of one of those. Um, I've been uh, exercising and eating better than I ever have in my life. A lot of people are doing that. I've been playing my my base a lot. I've been trying desperately to uh, be helpful to my children. My children are 14 and 15, and I, I can't imagine a worse age to be in lockdown. Uh, I, I try to imagine being 14 and locked in a house with my parents for four months, and I, 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 I don't even know how I would have gotten through it. I mean, I was a less, um, a less intelligent and measured child than my children. And um, so that that takes my time. And then a lot of time, I think, on some sort of um, low-level, weird, symptomatic depression. I mean, I, um, I, I don't have the ups and downs of emotion that I used to have. And by my reading, um, you know, there's, I believe there's some, uh, there's some damage there. And, I'm, uh, you know, you asked me about myself. And I'm answering about myself. And even as I do it, I feel very, very guilty because of, once again, the 8 billion people on the planet, I am doing the best. And that is not because of 
planning and uh, and talent and desire. That's a lot of it, you know, the uh, the roll of the dice. And uh, I won, and I'm doing very, very well. So when I hear myself complain, I find myself being sickened. <laughs> well, you know, I want to ask a little bit about yourself some more. Um, in the 2016 article you wrote, and let me just get the name of it, Hippie Meditation for an Old Punk, you talk about how Sam Harris turned you um, to meditation, and then you got a little bored with his type and went to um, – uh, the English headspace, mind. headspace, headspace, Andy. Yeah. Headspace. So, are you still meditating now? And if so, what are you doing? How are you? Doing? I have gone. Uh, I can tell you in a moment. Let me pull up the app because uh, we we want to have accuracy on Big Think, don't we? We don't want to go off half cocked. I have done one thousand six hundred and forty five days. Wow. Uh, without missing a day of Headspace. That's with Andy, and then I added in. About uh, 500 days ago, um, I added in uh, Sam Harris. Now, Sam Harris got me started meditating, but at the time, he didn't have an app. So I went to Headspace and started with Andy. And um, I don't know, you know, uh, my uh, my friend, uh, uh, Dr. Greger, who wrote the book, How to Survive a Pandemic and How Not to Die and How Not to Die It. Brilliant, brilliant man. He, he runs um, uh, nutritionfacts.org, which is a very, very good place for, strangely, nutrition facts. <laughs> Same as Pornhub is a great place for porn. It's right there in the title. Um, nutrition Facts is great for nutrition. And he also did a lot of research into meditation. And Sam has, of course, done a lot more. Um, and I don't know. Um, certainly some of the extraordinary claims require more evidence, but I have found that sitting, um, letting my thoughts go by and separating myself from my thoughts, far be it from me to try to explain meditation. But as I'm seeing it now, uh, I do that about 10 minutes a day with Sam and about 10 minutes a day with Andy. And I believe uh, I have found some um, some solace, perhaps some wisdom, and some um, um, gentleness from that. Uh, but also, during that time, I've become three years older. And that also brings that stuff. And we're so trapped in our bodies without a, uh, without a control group, we can't learn any of that. You know, I used to... Back when I was carny trash, I still am carny trash, but back when I was a street performer, um, I did everything with brute force. You know, I ripped my throat out to be heard by 500 people outside. The fact that I was coughing up blood and the fact that I couldn't speak in a normal tone, I could only yell or whisper, uh, didn't deter me. And um, I had this raw drive, this crazy energy, you know, work 18 hours a day and um, not sleep. And, you know, at, at the time we were on Broadway, when I was, you know, in my 30s, I was doing, you know, uh, Howard Stern, David Letterman, Saturday Night Live, writing a book, doing a home video, and doing eight shows a week on Broadway, plus an occasional movie and Miami Vice thrown in there. Wow. And I did that all with brute force. I mean, just brute force. Uh, not really caring very much the amount of damage I did to myself uh, emotionally or physically. And just with this kind of um, ambition and drive uh, that I uh, unleashed. And which, you know, uh, even though I wasn't going towards there, I never wanted to be on Broadway. I never wanted to have a Vegas show. I just wanted to do a show. And I thought that was impossible. You know, my dad was a jail guard and Teller's dad was a commercial artist. And we never thought that you could really make your living performing. So we, we pushed, you know, perhaps, perhaps too hard. And now uh, in the past five years, you know, since I lost weight and since I started meditating and changed, I've 
I've tried to do what I want to do and get my goals accomplished, but with less um, brutality and less push and more gentleness, Uh, maybe a little more with my heart and a little more with my mind. And I believe that meditation is either a facilitator or a symptom. Uh, You know, I I can't tell which. Uh, Once again, I don't have that. As much as I want that control pen that does the other road so I can compare, I don't have that. Well, speaking about your health, I watched your most recent Big Think interview yesterday. And this great line I loved, which was, if you take medical advice from a um, Las Vegas magician, you deserve to die. Um, (laughs) This was when you were talking about you were working with Ray Cronice and we're following one diet. And now I listened on your podcast, you're doing something different. I'd love to learn about that. And also you said in the, in the interview in 2016, you were not exercising and now you just said you are. So Mm -hmm. I just want to hear about that in your life. Okay. Well, um, uh, when you need to do um, drastic, insane weight loss, uh, in a very concentrated way. And uh, there have been studies that um, the faster you lose weight, the longer you keep it off. I lost over 100 pounds in about four months, and I have kept most of it off, more than two-thirds of it off for five years, which is statistically uh, an anomaly. Most people who do Weight Watchers three years later have made a difference of eight pounds. You know, it's... Um, to have kept off 75 or 80 pounds for five years puts me in a very, very statistically small amount. I did that with a huge change in diet, which was, um, you can't say vegan. Vegan is political, um, which I'm also vegan. But for diet purposes, uh, it is um, uh Whole food plant-based, which just means um, uh, no heavily processed food and everything from plants. And when I first started out, I referred to myself as an unethical vegetarian, uh, unethical vegan, sorry, because I was not caring about animal welfare and I was not caring about cruelty and I was not caring about the environment. I was only caring about my own health. And somehow, and I've seen this happen to so many people, um, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's chemical or if it's habit, but so many people who've stopped animal products for health reasons end up also being disgusted by the cruelty and the environmental impact. I mean, um, uh, our treatment of animals is responsible for the COVID-19. Uh, the next, uh, you know, N1, H1 flu epidemic that will come is because of how we treat, you know, chickens and pigs. And um, uh, we are making them very, very, very sick. And we are uh, living in a world with them. And that sickness spreads. You don't need anything supernatural. You don't need retribution. It's just make, make, uh, make a species really, really, really sick and live with them constantly, you may get sick too. Uh, and uh, But all of my original drive was just for health. So I would occasionally, uh, I hate using this word, but I will cheat and, you know, and eat animal products and eat badly. And that was still kind of working for my health. But that fell away when the other two reasons to uh, be plant-based came in. And then during the lockdown, then I started exercising because whenever I said not exercise, I only meant during the extreme weight loss periods because you can't be bodybuilding and losing weight at the same time. Uh, It's just contrary. Uh, So as soon as I lost all the weight, I started exercising. I started exercising rather casually and the minimum I could do because I hate it. I loathe it. I don't like moving. If I had my way, I would spend 18 hours a day typing. I don't want to stand up to go get tea. I have no desire in my life to move. I don't want to hike. I don't want to run around. But 
I can't find even a nut study that says sitting still is, I guess Trump has said it, but that's beyond nut. Um, so I was exercising. And then during lockdown, I have a friend, um, Jason Garfield, who's one of the best jugglers in the world. Uh, and he do, runs all this juggling stuff. If you look up Jason Garfield, the juggler, he'll be thrown to a website with more juggling than everybody wants to see. Of course, the most juggling anyone wants to see is about three minutes. So it doesn't take much to be more juggling. But he is also a bodybuilder and has been since he was 12 or 13. And when I changed over to uh, Cray Ray, to uh, Ray Cronice, and Dr. Gregor and Dr. Clapper and Dr. Furman, who have all become friends of mine. Um, Jason, because he's a friend, came along with me. And he became one of the bodybuilders who is plant-based, which used to be considered crazy just eight years ago. And now your top bodybuilders are very often vegan. Turns out it's more helpful. And um, the dogs are barking in the background. I'm sorry. They found me in my lair. Uh, and... Uh, uh, I decided that I would give myself over to him and give him 20 minutes to a half hour a day during lockdown on, on FaceTime for him to really exercise me in the way he wanted to. So he decided to do bodybuilding stuff. So I have been lifting heavy things. And he also is one of the people who goes to failure which means when he exercises, he exercises until you wouldn't want to be seen at the gym doing it. So you lift these weights and curls till you can't lift that weight, and then you go lower till you can't lift that weight, then you go lower till you can't lift that weight, and then you go until if your eye itches, it's just easier to let it keep itching than to lift your arm up like this because it's too goddamn heavy. Um, and and uh, he also cares tremendously about form. You have to do everything perfectly. There's nothing that, you know, you can't move your elbow a half inch to get a little better leverage. There's no momentum. And that has been the changes in the way I feel um, have been astonishing. Now, I ran up against a problem with the diet that I was having, which was uh, I wasn't having, and you could feel it and see it in my body, and in my performance, I wasn't getting enough um, protein to be able to build the muscles I wanted to build. So I have done what, you know, uh, Ray Cronice would never have anyone do unless they were actively exercising in this way. And that, and that is taking in more protein. Once again, not animal protein, but, you know, stuff that I didn't eat before, like tofu and tempeh and uh, and pea protein and stuff like that. I'm still down to uh, intermittent fasting, although instead of doing 23 hours a day without a calorie, I now do 20 so that right after my exercise, I can have some fruit and some protein to build it. And I have, um, uh, I am doing what I said in my last big think was impossible. And that is that I'm, I'm uh, building muscle and losing weight at the same time. And uh, none, neither of those is done the most efficiently by doing them together. But I don't care about efficient as much as I did. When I had 100 pounds to lose or 120 pounds to lose, that was really important. Now that I have about 20 pounds to lose, it's uh, much less important to do it wicked fast. And I can do it while getting in better shape. Of course, I'm 65, so I'm never going to look great. But um, I'll tell you, being able to um, sit up a lot easier, you know, from doing these impossible sit-ups with weights and stuff like that, I, I just feel better. And I've always had kind of a week back. How long have you had that, Penn? Well, about a week back. Um, <laughs> uh, I've always had a week back. And, and building what is, you know, called the core uh, has been um, – very helpful. So I'm enjoying that. And uh, I've also found working with Jason Garfield that um, I've had trainers in the past, you know, trying to save my fat self from food. Um, I've never found anything that worked as well as a half hour with a uh, with Jason on FaceTime. Something about not, you know, when you when you have someone come to your house, you go to a gym. 
a half hour isn't long enough. You feel like you should invest a full hour. And if you're working out by yourself, a half hour is too long. Like, Jesus, it's been 10 minutes. Christ, can I sit down again? But a half hour with someone on a, um, you know, if people have the wherewithal to do that, it's been um, very useful to me to have a little uh, iPhone on a tripod and a person yelling at me and counting. Well, I know that our audience wants to know about, and we advertise that we'd be asking you about your partnership with Teller. And sure. how how do you think that you've had such an enduring and prolific partnership? Well, I've explained this many times. Um, when you meet people, um, and now this has been so strange, I, I, I worry for my children. But um, when you meet someone in person, uh, some people, you have a uh, real desire to hug them and breathe them and touch them. And this is a sexual drive, but um, <clears throat> I found it for many, many people that is not not attached to sex at all. There's just some people you, you just want to be with. And um, uh, there's that cuddly feeling. And there's other people who your relationship would be identical if it were over email, totally intellectual. And uh, I have friends, lifetime friends uh, of both kinds. I have friends that I just like to be near and I want to just touch. And I don't know if that's pheromones or if that's a distance their eyes are apart or what that is that my little, you know, lizard brain brings me to them. But uh, it's not tied with with sex necessarily, although it feels that. It feels romantic all the time. Um, and then there are people that I do not feel that at all. So Teller and I have never had any affection for one another. No desire to hug. We only shake hands when it's part of a script. Um, we don't seek out each other's company. But uh, there's no one that I respect more. And I believe at a core level that I do better stuff with Teller than I do alone. And we have proof of that in the world. You can look at the stuff I've done with Teller and the stuff I've done alone. The stuff I do with Teller is better. He also feels the, uh, the converse. Um, he does a lot of, he does stuff alone. He does stuff with me. He feels the stuff with me is better. Um, Lennon and McCartney were obviously in love, head over heels in love with one another. And when they had a rough patch and when they started growing up and getting married and having children, that love dissolved into something very, very ugly, which we see chronicled and let it be. Um, with Martin and Lewis, the most successful team in the history of the United States, uh, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis were clearly in love. It may have been more one-sided. It may have been more Jerry in love with Dean because Dean may have been a sociopath. But um, there was that bond of love. And when they broke up, it was horrible and very, very ugly. And we saw that you know, with Gilbert and Sullivan um, writing musicals in English at the uh, turn of the last century. Uh, Keller and I have never had love or affection. It has always been respect. And it turns out respect is more enduring than love. Now, I have to add here that my daughter, uh, whenever I say this, gets very, very bothered because she says that Teller is my BFF and there's no way around that. And that's absolutely true. Uh, I'm saying that in a kind of skeletal way. Um, the truth is that Teller's my best friend over all those years, that that respect has grown into affection. And the first person to see my children when they were born after medical personnel and my wife was Teller. <laughs> the first person to hold Moxie was Teller. Uh, they certainly see Teller as their uncle and his family. When my parents died, the first person I went to was Teller. When Teller's parents died, the first person he came to was me. For anything that's important and life-changing, we're there. But for um, for camaraderie, for friendship, we go elsewhere. You know, Teller and I, and of course, I, I got to put a big parenthesis around the lockdown. 
But the previous 44 years, Keller and I were working an average seven days a week and an average 10 hours a day for that entire time. Wow. So going out to dinner afterwards and saying, well, tell them what did you do today? His only answer is going to be the same fucking thing you did today, Penn. So to have a relationship, you want to have it with other people. And we do have, and if you talk to our close friends, we have several close friends who are close friends with both of us and never see us together. <laughs> I mean, in our movie, um, uh, Tim's Vermeer, Tim Jennison is really good friends with both of us. And he comes to town and has coffee with Teller and then lunch with me. <laughs> it's a different relationship. So I believe that being businesslike is really important to a long-term partnership. Teller and I are incredibly polite to each other um, in general and incredibly cruel to each other artistically. That's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. Shut up, shut up, shut up. I hate this. That's constant in our writing sessions. Uh, neither one of us does any drugs or any alcohol. Neither one of us is ever late. If we say there's a meeting at 11, Teller and I are both there at 5 of 11. It's almost a joke that every conference call we have with business people, the first three minutes is Teller and I talking to each other. We are always the first two on every call. We are always the first two in any room for a business meeting. Teller never makes mistakes. I mean, we do stuff that in a certain sense is risking our lives. And if Teller says he's going to do something, he will do it. Uh, we also never apologize. If we've said something out of line or we've done something incorrect, we never apologize. That just brings it up again. We just go on. We also know that if we aren't getting along, which happens, that we have the show to do. So who cares if we're not getting along? We're kind of like two guys who run a, you know, a 7-Eleven or a dry cleaner place. If you don't get along with your coworker a day or two, that ain't no deal. But Lennon and McCartney, who were in love, that was a deal. Right. Well, so I'm going to turn to some of our audience questions now. And um, these are questions that I'm, I'm sure you get a lot. But, um, but let me just ask you something. Uh, yes. How many questions did you have written down and how many did you get to? I bet you had 20 and you got to four. Is that correct? I did. I had maybe even a few more than that, but <laughs> also interested in some of the follow-up. So I was going to ask you about Shin Lim on, um, on the, the show, but um, the audience wants me to go to these. So okay. um, what are your views on religion being practiced at schools? Uh, that's an easy one. Um, I just got a wonderful message from someone who said that, uh, Jesus loved me and that they were praying for me on a daily basis. And they hoped that I would find Jesus and see that love in my heart. And my answer back to them was, uh, thank you. I appreciate that very much. Uh, as you probably know, I'm an atheist and, uh, uh, I, uh, that doesn't mean I can't accept that love. I think that, uh, religion being open and in the world and everywhere, uh, being discussed is a very, very good thing. I think religion on the whole is a very, very bad thing. And I also think that one of the wonderful ideas of the United States of America was to allow religion to flourish and to allow an open debate of religion and never have uh, the state either um, either support it, you know, or uh, or attack it. So I think there can be no mixture of church and state whatsoever. I think that has to be an absolute uh, wall with no cracks in it whatsoever. I don't think you can ever put a cross or the Ten Commandments on public ground. That is wrong to make me pay for that. It is just wrong to make me pay for that. And to have my children uh, go to a public school and be uh, have any sort of mention of religion is really, really wrong. And it's not only wrong to me, it's also wrong to those who are religious. They do not want atheist children mouthing 
uh, their words and um, and uh, making a mockery of it. Uh, I will make a mockery of it on my own time and on my own dime. And uh, that's a really, really nice system. And we shouldn't ever, ever cheat that at all. And there are some places where that becomes a little bit tricky, but school is not one of them. Great. Well, so here's another question. Is there one permanent positive change that you think the pandemic will yield? Uh, yes. I think it will get us a little bit more ready for the next pandemic. Isn't that an awful, horrible thing to say? But in 1917, uh, a lot of the Asian cultures started wearing masks when they were sick. And um, for some reason, the Western cultures didn't. We abandoned the mask, mask afterwards. I would like to think that wearing masks when you're feeling at all sick and also staying home when you're feeling at all sick, I would like to think that's permanent. Uh, I hope that um, some of the considering about animals uh, will be um, will be permanent. I mean, we could, even if you don't want to be plant-based, we could spend about $3 more a year for chicken and make it so that they were suffering less and that we suffered less. Uh, I think there's a lot of kind of silly changes that are already permanent. Um, uh, I think that we'll be able to communicate better electronically. It's nice to see um, television talk shows uh, getting used to uh, doing the interviews virtually like we are now. I think that's a very good way to do it. It saves energy. It allows you to have better guests easier. And I think if we get used to having that, it's much better. I think getting used to doing um, uh, uh, electronic communication with people that you love around the world, uh, maybe skipping coffee in public sometimes, in person sometimes to be able to do that. I think that's I think that's permanent. And I think also, uh, and I'm being incredibly optimistic, but I've already outed myself as a uh, pathological optimist. I also think that a lot of the, um, a lot of the anti-intellectual crazy hate that, that Trump and those of us who follow Trump have brought to the country, I think that will fade. I think that by November, um, majority of this country will see that um that that hate driven um policies are not good for people and that um uh the idea of turning uh, masks into long hair is uh one of the most repulsive things that's ever been done uh the, the sentence that trump says when he says some people are wearing masks just to be against me that kind of team play with something so important I think that we will learn from that. Right. And I also think that somehow the pandemic, somehow, and this is too complex probably for anyone, but certainly for me, uh, gave us uh, the Black Lives Matter movement in some sort of odd way. And I think the Black Lives Matter movement will push civil rights uh, a little bit further forward. And we have so far to go. And we've we've come so far, but um, we've got so far to go that any little push towards uh, towards more kindness is uh, is a very good thing. So That's I think there'll be some good that'll come of it. Uh, the price is too high. Do I have to say that? Or the price is too high. Well, that's great. That was actually another audience question. So you addressed it yourself. And now here's one on libertarianism. So this one is long. Would you agree that being a libertarian carries the responsibility of being educated, educated enough to know when it is important to act in the interest of others, not just oneself? Well, libertarianism has been so distorted. I mean, I don't know if I have to pull, uh, pull my name out of that ring. It's been adopted by people who uh, don't seem to hold the responsibility side of it. And don't seem to hold the compassion side of it. Um, my view of libertarianism is that it is the freedom to help other people your, by yourself and, and not do, um, not do it at gunpoint. And the idea 
that it's your freedom to spread a virus that will kill people, will kill me. I'm 65 years old. I've had pneumonia twice. I mean, I think Bill Nye said that you don't wear a mask to protect yourself. You wear a mask to protect me. And um, I can do that first person because I am high risk. You know, if, if Teller and I catch the virus, our chances of dying are, are high. You know, Teller's had a heart problem. I've had pneumonia and uh, we're 65. And um, the idea that a, that a mask being equated with freedom is, is sickening. Uh, I mean, in my view of libertarianism, we would be the first ones to cancel shows and slap masks on. The first ones to say a distance. Because if I want to have my freedom, what I have to do is fight to the death for your freedom. Until you have freedom and health and kindness, my freedom doesn't mean anything. So my freedom is tied absolutely to your freedom to be virus free and to walk down the street safely and have the food and medical care you need. And I don't mean you generally, I mean you, Victoria. You know, any problem that you have has to be my problem or I don't have freedom. The idea can exist in a vacuum is, is a fucked up idea that should not be tied to libertarianism. On top of that, I'm not sure anymore that there's a way to uh, take care of the health of everybody with individuals. It's possible that there is stuff that has to be in a safety net in order to protect everybody. Well, I'm going to ask the question that I wrote, because I think we have a little bit more time, which was the show um, with Chin Lim, which has 62 million views. Um, he, I believe, wanted to be a pianist and had maybe carpal tunnel syndrome or something. So was uh, went into magic instead. Was obviously excellent at it. Have there been any failures in your life that have actually propelled your career? Huh. That's interesting. Uh, Shin, Shin, is, Shin is so great. Um, uh, yes. I mean, every failure. Uh, and I don't mean to jump on, uh, on Shin Lim's um, bandwagon here, but when I'm asked about my heroes and my inspirations, um, uh, they all come from fields outside of uh, outside of magic. Um, it's not literally true. There's Johnny Thompson and there's uh, Amazing Randy. But um, I wanted to be Bob Dylan. Uh, I wanted to be Frank Zappa. Uh, I wanted to be Randy Newman. I wanted to be Martin Mull. And um, I uh, those were everything to me. I mean, still, when that new Dylan album comes out, uh, it, it, it's unbelievable. I mean, he is still in front of us all, clearing the brush with his with his machete of talent. I mean, he's he's still the best. And um, you know, we miss Zappa every day, uh, Hendrix. Uh, I'm going. I'm not saying there's nobody good in music now because there's more people who are better in music now. But I'm talking about when I was young, when I was 12, 13. And I uh, wanted desperately to be a musician. And um, I uh, was not, uh, did not have a good singing voice, uh, although that hasn't stopped me from singing. Uh, I did not have a good ear, which has not stopped me from playing. And uh, I looked at the hand I was dealt at 15 and, you know, fanned that hand out and said, if I'm going to go into music, I'm going to be competing with Lou Reed and Bob Dylan and Frank Zappa, and uh, I will lose. I also, it's the Guns and Roses theory. Guns and Roses loved the Rolling Stones. If you love the Rolling Stones, why on earth would you form a band? Because the Rolling Stones are already doing a fine job. Why do we need Guns N' Roses again? So the idea that I would go into a field that Bob Dylan was doing perfectly seemed insane. I then looked when I met Teller at the field of magic. I saw who was in that and said, wait a minute, I could compete in this. <laughs> so um, I would say, you know, not to, not to just 
directly do the same answer as Shin Lim. Uh, his was carpal tunnel. Mine was a lack of talent. Uh, I also uh, oh, really, really, really wanted to be a writer. And um, I, I still am. Uh, I mean, I, I put eight books out and they've done well. Um, and I do write the Penn and Teller stuff. Um, but uh, not really having a, a, a roadmap to um, to getting to um, to getting to earning my living as an author, uh, I think helped that failure helped. So a failed musician, a failed author. Also, we can throw in their failed clown. I went to Ringling Brothers Barnum Bailey Greatest Show on Earth uh, Clown College, and uh, I wasn't good. I found myself to be a not talented physical comedian, uh, so I was not a clown. Uh, I found when I was a juggler, and I was a very good juggler, that um, the more I talked and the less I juggled, the more people liked me. So I kind of am a failed jock juggler. I never got that good. I mean, compare me to the other people <clears throat> in 1975. I was very, very good. Compare me to Jason Garfield, and I'm not. So I would say uh, failed uh, juggler, failed clown. Failed musician, failed songwriter, failed singer, uh, failed uh, a failed writer, failed author, failed poet, uh, and failed sex symbol puts me right where I am today. Well, this is my last question, um, just one of my own. What is it that gives you joy? You know, you have to give. Um, you have to start with the cliched answer because it's also true. And that is you have to say family. Uh, I am trying. No, I have successfully weaned myself from the, um, uh, the joy of, uh, of acceptance from an audience and just taken that as a joy of shared performance. Did I just say anything different? I love being in a room when a live show is happening. I used to feel that that attention had to be on me every second. And now that seems less important. It's a, it's a deeper, richer, more honest kind of joy. And uh, I always have a joy at what's called, uh, I believe what's called flow. When I'm working and uh, typing and I'm deep into an idea, I love that. Uh, I get huge joy from talking to friends, uh, a nice, deep conversation that's not about gossip and complaining, but actually about ideas like what books have you read? Uh, by the way, reading is a great deal of joy. But lately, as I get older and as I work at it, I'm trying to find a joy uh, in inaction, a joy of being alive and a joy of just sitting in where I am right now. And even, and I hope this doesn't sound callous, but even the joy of suffering, uh, a joy of saying, I'm uncomfortable and that's okay because I'm alive. Uh, the great songwriter John Hartford in one of his songs, uh, Celebrating Life, wrote, this might be my last chance to get sick. And I think that, you know, um, and the stuff from Eastern religions, Buddhism and so on, um, which, by the way, there's a, there's a lot of people who practice Buddhism without any supernatural beliefs or any sort of God at all. Sam Harris being probably the best known, but there are many, many others. And I'm trying to find uh, my joy in the past has been an active kind of joy. And I'm trying as I get older to find a passive kind of joy. That, this has been so wonderful. Thank you so much, Penn. This is one of the, the most interesting interviews I've conducted. And it's oh, been fabulous. What a, what a nice thing to say. Thank you so much. And please, please stay safe. I hope I will. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So, no, goodbye. <laughs>